All right, welcome everybody to today's webinar, Census of Community Composters. We're going to cover key challenges, uh, key findings, key challenges, and the future outlook for community composting in the U.S. and beyond. This is part six of our series on how local governments can support community composting. Um, everybody is in listen-only mode. If you have questions, uh, please type them into the question um, tab of your control, go to webinar control panel. Um, let me introduce um, the staff today. So joining me, I should introduce myself. I'm Brenda Platt, the Institute, for, um, the director of the Composting for Community Initiative at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And joining me to be our main presenter today is Clarissa Libertelli and she is the coordinator of the Community Composter Coalition that ILSR has been convening for a number of years. And she led the research and the findings with um, another colleague of ours, Megan Matthews, who's, not, um, who's participating on the webinar but not presenting with her today on the census, the Community Composter Census. So Clarissa, say hi. Hello. Hi. And Jordan Ashby is just our tech support in the background, going to be helping us curate your questions, so keep those coming. Um, let me just again say that this is one in, in a series we've been doing um, on webinars. The um, And go to the next slide, Clarissa. Uh, you can check these out. They're all recorded on our website. We started with a spotlight on New York City contracts, moved on to food scrap collectors and composters that have other contracts with other municipalities. And then we featured cities and counties that have public-private partnerships with community composters. Part four last October was like a menu of a whole bunch of different options from zoning to grants and covered also some contracts. And then we did food scrap drop-off partnerships earlier this year. And then today, again, we're, we're um, reporting on the findings of our census of community composters. I just want to say a word about the Institute and what we're doing to, um, uh, um, what we're doing in this space. But before I get to that, let me just say that the way that this webinar will be run is Clarissa will present and for about 30 minutes. We'll maybe take a few questions for her if time allows, but then we'll introduce our panelists that are joining us today, Courtney Brown with the California Alliance for Community Composting, Sophia Hussein, who's the Zero Waste Manager for the Baltimore City Department of Public Works, Sandy Briggs is with the City of Boulder, she's in the Climate Initiatives Department, Jay Alou um, Bayewu is with the City of Atlanta, Mayor's Office of Sustainability and Resilience, and he's the Urban Ag Director, and Carolyn Vance with ReFed, and, and heads up a lot of their uh, capital innovations and investment portfolio there. So we'll be hearing from this panel in response to what Clarissa is presenting. But let me say a word about what the composting for, commu composting for Community Initiative at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance has been doing. We hold, in addition to web webinars, we have a podcast. Please check that out. We have a community composter coalition. Many, many of you who are joining us today are members of that coalition. We have a Google group that's just for members of the coalition. We have a lot of policy resources. We have some videos. We do an in-person training every year. Um, the next slide shows some of the other webinars that are not part of this series that we, we've done, which are all available, again, recorded, anything from entity structure for community composters to how to avoid rodent issues at your sites, um, selling and using compost, so equipment for small small scale equipment. So check those out too. We invite you also to learn about our online community composter training course. So we designed this course because we saw that it was a gap between home composter training programs and training programs for larger facilities. There wasn't one that was kind of geared towards schools or community gardens or urban farms. So this is this course that's online. You can um, earn a certificate for completing it. It's available and we do have bulk discounts and scholarships available. So Jordan is putting those links in the chat and um, check those out. And then as to tee up 
you know what we'll be talking today we produce this a little small to see i'm sure but you can uh jordan will put the link in the chat too this is a graphic we produced some time ago our high hierarchy to reduce food waste but also grow community and you know it has it's similar to epas in that it's prioritizes source reduction prevent waste rescue edible food but then our lens is really um what we add here is the lens of local and issues of scale. So we have home composting, we have small scale decentralized before medium size, locally based, and then centralized. So the census of community compost was really focusing on that part where that arrow is pointing to a small scale decentralized and Clarissa will go into a little bit more detail. So at this point, I want to um, run a quick poll just so we can see who's participating today. We have close to 100 people already joining us. Welcome, everybody. Um, so Clarissa, if you could run the poll. Let me know if you want me to. Okay, what best describes your affiliation? So select the best option, even if you fall into more than one of these buckets. Community composter food scrap collection service provider, local government, state or federal government, or other. And we'd like to see if we can get at least 75% of you voting, which we have reached. Thank you. Let's show the results. All right, we have 42% of you are with local government. Welcome. Almost one fifth community composters. So with that, Clarissa, let me hand the reins to, um, I already introduced the panelists, so you can go right to your presentation. Thank you for that, Brenda. Um, let me just bump back here. So uh, that was a good little introduction with the food waste hierarchy into uh, a little bit about what community composting is, but I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. So um community composting is composting that keeps the composting process local which means it also keeps the benefits of composting local which i'm sure we know there are many but we'll get into those um, and also composting that involves engaging the community and providing opportunities for training education basically anything that involves community investment so these are composters that are invested and based in their local communities so we wanted to focus on um, community composting for our census because this is an underrepresented sector of the larger composting industry, and there is a data gap here. We want that data for composters themselves to get to know a little bit more about what their fellow operations are doing and what's working for them. We're also hoping that this will be the first of many censuses to come. So it will be a measure, uh, a baseline to measure future growth and also evolution in this sector. Um, and then we also wanted to, of course, document the benefits of community composting for advocacy reasons and identify the challenges so that uh, we can find ways to overcome those barriers. So as Brenda mentioned, I'm the Community Composter Coalition Coordinator. This is a picture of our forum back in January. Um, not all of the people here are CCC members, but I put this in here to say that the census did go out to the CCC members. We have almost 300 members now, US-based, but also um, we have some members from abroad. And it went also to a targeted outreach list of other community composters. So we ended up getting uh, 86 complete responses from 33 states plus DC, Puerto Rico, and Canada. These were composting services, collection services, but the majority, 74%, were actually both. And you can see from this map that they're spread across the US, but the top two states that we heard back from were California and New York. So the participants, to give you an idea of who these composters were, um, a lot were off-site composters, which means the composting was done in a different loca location than the food scraps were generated. 
Um, and also the majority had food scrap drop-off programs, but we also had farms, composting demonstration sites, gardens, and more. Um, and a majority were private businesses, but we also had a quarter that were nonprofit and then a kind of mix of public and private. So we saw that there was quite a range in size of operations um, from 75 pounds to 4 million. So quite a, quite a big difference there of total incoming material in 2021. So because the census was data was collected in 2022, whenever we have a yearly number that comes actually from 2021. Um, but yeah, over half of operations report handling over 500,000 pounds of organic material in 2021. So it's a large amount of material. And uh, we also saw a lot of variety in the composting methods used, not just in different sizes of systems, but in the actual operations. Uh, on the left, you can see a list of the different methods and a majority of respondents actually used more than one method of composting. And you can see here on the right are the top three used. Windrows uh, was the number one and then bin systems and then vermicomposting. So that's composting with worms. Um, and this is first of a few graphics I'm gonna show that are actually available on our website um, from the census report. And it shows this closed loop of community composting. So the sources uh, are primarily residential was one of the, the biggest sources reported by a majority of respondents. But even uh, over one fifth of respondents reported collecting from supermarket chains, universities and colleges, K through 12 schools, small grocery stores. So some pretty big food waste generators uh, also showed up as sources for respondents. And then we see that the compost went back to gardens and local home gardens, community gardens, farms and donation, and then also client give back. So the compost came from the communities and it ended up as well in those communities. And then we saw a variety of revenue sources too. Um, the number one revenue source that was identified by our respondents was collection service fees. But of course, there's also sales of compost. There's trainings and workshops and speaking fees because of that community engagement portion of what community composters do. And then uh, grants is also a big one. And then this is a variety of the actual products that were sold. Um, so we had a lot of other, we collected data on vehicles that were used and kind of how often compost was tested and things like that. Um, but the point is, is that we saw community composting is varied. Um, there's no one size fits all model for what community composting is because it's tailored to the individual needs of those communities. And as we can see from uh, that, these respondents came from all across the US that uh, it can be for a variety of different places. Um, the next big takeaway that we saw from our census report is that community composting is impactful. So that goes back to showing those benefits. Like I already mentioned, uh, com the composting process happens locally, and that's not just nearby where food scraps are generated, but actually 82% uh, of respondents reported composting sites that were located within those areas that were served by their collection services. Um, and a lot of those are also using their compost on site. So a very tight closed loop. Um, and then in addition to that, the other piece of community composting is the community engagement. So we heard from people that were having groups of children come see their composting sites from K through 12 schools, um, volunteer opportunities, uh, community events. So there was a variety of different things, but also the average number of volunteers that were reported, consistent volunteers was seven. And then beyond just volunteers, there's paid staff uh, that offers green jobs to local communities. So 76% have active employees. And um, those numbers are actually we found a lot more than the green jobs, or I mean, those aren't green jobs, but then the jobs provided by incineration and landfills. So 
we did calculations on the job factors for community composting and we found that the job factor was six times that of incineration and three times over three times that of landfilling um, which means that if just half of food scraps flowing to landfills and incinerators were diverted to community composting it could provide over 50,000 new jobs and that's not including collection um, and that's around the same size as the U.S. coal mining industry. So that is no small amount of jobs from just half of the food scraps going to community composting. And then the jobs themselves uh, look a lot different than the waste industry's jobs as a whole. So the waste industry is 83% male, whereas community composters were only 33% male. And then we also found that the staff was um, an average of 32% LGBTQ+, which is over 4.5 times the national percentage of LGBTQ+, identifying adults in 2021. Uh, so happy Pride Month, everyone. And then not only are these benefits going to um, communities, they're going to communities that really need them. Um, we saw high percentages of composters are serving rural and urban communities. These are ones that are faced by very specific environmental burdens that can be mitigated by composting, like urban uh, heat island effects and rural lack of access to healthy foods. And then also we saw that community composters are serving a higher percentage of Hispanic and Latino populations and non-white populations in 56% of states represented um, and these are populations communities that face a disproportionate amount of the environmental burdens that can be potentially mitigated by composting and we also found that um, in a lot of the places these community composters are working there was no previous composting infrastructure so they're expanding access and they're expanding access to the communities that need it and then we saw that community composting tackles wasted food. Um, I'm sure we all know that food waste is a huge component of landfills and incinerators, and yet it's a very small portion of what is actually composted in the US. And that's because most composting operations in this country only compost yard trimmings, which is a stark contrast to the community composters that we saw, 97% of which were reporting handling food scraps. So they're the ones, it's not just, you know, who's doing composting, where they're doing composting, but it's also what is being compost. And it's community composters that are tackling our food waste problem. And then we did the classic, um, you know, reporting on what the finished compost looks like in terms of metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent sequestered. Uh, which is, you know, impressive numbers, always great to see, and the kind of stuff that grants often look at in terms of metrics. Um, but we did not want to just focus on quantifiable measurements of the benefits of community composting. That's something that we're thinking about a little bit more for future censuses. How do we show these kind of watershed benefits that it's tough to always put a number on the price of, um, of savings or on amount save, uh, you know, how do you measure the benefits of psychological well being from people being exposed to greenery and the outdoors and environmental education in a neighborhood that didn't have that before? So it's everything from, uh, as I mentioned, mitigating the heat island effect to providing community gathering spaces. Um, to promoting environmental awareness and uh, the interest in stewarding local land. So we're thinking a little bit more about how we might be able to ask questions that get at those, but um, it's important just to recognize it. So I wanted to put it out there. And then our final takeaway was that community composters um, are growing. So this is a growing sector of the industry. We can see that in the year that the compost programs began and how that's been, the growth rate has been increasing in recent years. Over 90% of the programs that we surveyed started since 2010 um, and over half since 2017. 
But not only that, the actual quantity of food scraps that are being handled by these composters was um, grew in over a quarter of operations, it grew from 2021 to 2022. And uh, now we're moving to the challenges portion because that is the big focus of this webinar. Um, we saw that scaling up is reflected in the challenges. So there's, this is a growing sector, but it also has growing pains uh, because as I said, it's underrepresented. So the challenges that I'm gonna go through um, in the actual census report, they're kind of all combined into one and compared to each other. But uh, for this presentation, I kind of broke them down into sections. So we're first taking a look at site challenges. Uh, scaling up was the number one site challenge identified by response respondents, but access to land is a big one. Lack of small scale equipment. Um, equipment manufacturers often overlook the need for mid-sized equipment. There's, you know, there's small shovels and DIY screeners for community gardens, and that's great. And then there's huge tanks for centralized composting facilities, but there isn't a lot of accessible options for mid-sized mid operations, which a lot of community composters are. And then we also see space constraints and then regulations issues, things like that. So here are some quotes from respondents talking about their struggles with equipment. You can see that uh, they feel limited by their inability to efficiently process their compost and um, need a little bit more than just a shovel to get things done. And then we also have a quote on the lengthy state permitting processes that can really slow down operations. Um, at, at a small scale, a lot of people, uh, a lot of our respondents reported being exempt from state and local permitting and uh, permit permitting and regulation requirements. But as you grow, uh, those become roadblocks for community composters. Um, in terms of compost process. Our number one issue that was raised was contamination. So that can look like anything from the classic fruit and vegetable stickers that are found on produce to PFAS and persistent herbicides that are becoming a hot topic. Um, and then there's other comments on having to maintain sites uh, through variable weather. And then in terms of marketing challenges, we saw marketing outreach and education as the number one challenge in this area. Um, and then followed by customers' willingness to pay and price sensitivity. Then there's also the third one is kind of a good problem to have meeting demand for compost. So that's good to see. But uh, this comment that we see under it was under the marketing section, but it's about depackagers. So there is some overlap with contamination. Um, this has been a hot topic recently. There's these big deep packagers that um, large scale facilities use to separate uh, packaging from the food waste um, that smaller scale community composters can't compete with because they require source separation. So that is a growing issue. And then in business and financial challenges, we see again, scaling up is a big one and then funding and financing. So those are the top two. We also see insurance as a challenge. There's a comment here about workers comp. That's something we're working on in our coalition is exploring if there's a way to um, maybe combine our data to get more affordable insurance rates for community composting, because this is another piece of, uh, of the world of businesses and composting in which this uh, specific size and type of operation is overlooked. Um, so insurance is a really tough one for members of our coalition and was reported in the census as well. And then you can see partnerships with local gov government is on here. So that's relevant for today's webinar. And then we specifically asked respondents, do you generate sufficient earned income to sustain operations? So back to the funding and financing, um, only 36% confidently said yes. Um, and 
23% said no, but there's a lot in the middle there. So uh, this does not include grant to sustain grant funding to sustain operations. This is definitely an area in which composters need support to grow. And then this is the graphic that you can find in the report itself, where you see all of the different challenges kind of across all of the different categories together compared to one another. The bigger um, the word is, it's like a word cloud, the more often it was mentioned. So scaling up was the biggest, it was the biggest in business uh, and financial issues and in site issues, and then also the biggest just overall compared across categories. Um, and then all of the other boxes that you see that have graphics on them, that means that they were mentioned by over 40% of respondents. So willingness to pay in price sensitivity, space constraints, marketing, funding, access to land, adequate equipment, those are all really big ones. But um, there are a lot of ones that were mentioned here too that are worth exploring. And then we asked people about the solution. So if you had access to unfettered funding, what would you do with it? And uh, as you might expect, equipment and supplies was number one. Uh, vehicles was also a big one. And a number of respondents specifically noted that they would use it to buy electric fleets of vehicles, site improvements, staff, and being able to adequately pay staff. Uh, land sites and marketing were also up there. And then we also asked respondents what policy changes would make sustaining or replicating your operation easier. And um, this was an open ended question, but we kind of divided it into different themes. So that's what you see here. The number one recommended policy change was regulation allowances for small decentralized and starting up operations so that goes back to increasing the exemption thresholds for permitting um, making those permitting process processes faster zoning is all encompassed in that um, we also heard about prioritizing and or not undermining community composting projects these comments kind of ran the gamut because they were coming from people that were talking about their issues in their specific state or locality. Um, so that's anything from allowing certain types of composting or food scrap hauling to just promoting community composting as a zero waste strategy, promoting that uh, hierarchy that ILSR is promoting um, that, that really uplifts it as different from just any kind of centralized composting and then creating incentives for composting. So those look like utilities incentives, um, any kind of program that maybe gives money back to uh, people that are composting in residential, in residencies or uh, businesses. And then also funding community composting, of course, contamination prevention, uh, those could be plastic bag bans, uh, sticker, produce sticker bans, requiring source separation like we talked about. Um, and then composting mandates and waste diversion laws, landfill bans or fines, those all promote composting as a whole. And then community composting can be one of those solutions. So that is... Uh, most of the main points, there's a lot more in the report, but if you wanna share these highlights about the growth of community composting and the benefits of community composting, we have this carousel on ILSR's Instagram that you can share. And that's it. Uh, if you have any questions or thoughts, definitely you can put them in the questions of the GoToWebinar panel, but you can also email me at compostingforcommunity at ilsr.org, and there is the uh, link to the census again. Thanks, Clarissa. So we do have some questions coming in, and I think actually the first question I might be better uh, suited to answer, so um, it is, how did we calculate the jobs figures? And that's something I've been working on for many, many years. So I'll just say that the figure that Clarissa presented, which was 6.2 times 
more jobs through community composting than through incineration and landfilling was based on 27 operations that reported uh, full-time employees only including time spent on composting, so not on, we did not count collection jobs. And um, we also assume that the tonnage that's flowing through the composting facility, that only one quarter was food scraps. So there's more detail on how that number was calculated in the report itself, but I'll just say that the incineration and the landfilling numbers that we compared the census job numbers to is based on research we've been doing over many years on tracking jobs through landfills and incineration. And those numbers were reported in um, a report we did called Pay Dirt, Composting in Maryland to Reduce Waste, Create Jobs and Protect the Bay. So you can check those out. And Clarissa, if you want to add anything about the job figures, please, please do. Okay, so um, I don't see, there's a bunch of questions, keep them coming on um, that I think are good for our panel. So um, uh, we had one question from somebody, could ILSR and the Community Composter Coalition do a presentation for the insurance industry? I wonder if insurance, insurers would be more willing to insure affordably if they knew more about the process and benefits. So Clarissa, do you want to say a word on what we've been doing on insurance? <laughs> yeah, that's been some sort of work internally in our coalition. Uh, right now we're putting together a survey to collect information that might be relevant to insurance providers from uh, not just coalition members, we're hoping to open it up to any community composters because the more data that we have, the more likely we'll be able to get a lower rate for community composters. So we're working on that side of it right now, but a definitely interesting idea to promote the benefits of it to insurance providers. I don't know too much about how much that would sway the insurance world, but I like to think that they, they could be convinced by that. Yeah, and if you're a member of our coalition, we did do a uh, closed webinar to members of the coalition on insurance issues, and that is available as a recording. So if you're a newer member of the coalition, we can send you that link if you're interested. All right, so at this point, let us bring in our panel. So if our panelists could turn their um, audio and video videos on. Here we have Sandy Briggs from the city of um, Boulder, JLU. Bayewu, Carolyn Vance, Courtney Brown, and Sophia Hussein. So welcome everybody. And um, I'm gonna start by actually letting each of our panelists briefly introduce themselves and their connection to community composting. So Courtney, I'm gonna start with you. Thanks, Brenda. Hi, my name is Courtney Brown. I am the co-founder and director of the California Alliance for Community Composting. Um, we're based in California, obviously. Um, we are a coalition of the at most active community composters across the state. Um, we originally got together uh, to work on policy issues, actually work with government directly. Um, we've now gotten government to fund us and we've launched 120 compost hubs across the state over the last two years. Awesome. Sophia. Hey everyone, I am Sophia Hussein. I'm the Zero Waste uh, Coordinator for the Bureau of Solid Waste at Baltimore City's Department of Public Works. And your connection to community composting, just real briefly. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, I actually worked with ILSR for a long time on community composting specifically in Baltimore. Um, and so I have worked with a lot of the local uh, farms and gardens and uh, community networks promote uh, decentralized network here. All right, let's go to you, Jay Lu. Hey, uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, this is Jay Olu Baiwu, the Urban Agriculture Director from the City of Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta is, of course, in uh, Muscogee Creek uh, lands uh, here in Georgia in the Southeast region of the United States of America. So um, I've been the Urban Ag Director for two and a half years in the City of Atlanta. My connection to community composting goes back to 2013. Um, I started off with my hands in the soil, literally and figuratively, uh, turning uh, eight foot uh, windrows of compost um, and every now and then having some machinery to support it as well. So um, yeah, it's great to be on this call and great to have this wonderful panel with us as well. Sandy. 
Hi, everyone. Thanks, Brenda. I'm Sandy Briggs, and I'm the Sustainability Program Manager for the City of Boulder, Colorado's Climate Initiatives Department. And I am currently developing a strategy um, around a circular bioeconomy, I suppose we could call it, um, that will definitely include community composting as a portion of the, the overall strategy for managing Boulder's um, organic uh, waste and organic resources. And Caroline. Thank you. Thank you for having me on this panel. Um, so I'm Caroline Vance at Refed. Um, Refed is a national nonprofit um, and we're dedicated to completely to reducing uh, food loss and waste across the whole system. Um, we, but we spend a lot of our time kind of thinking about the solutions to the, the challenge. Um, you know, at each point where food is lost across the, the vast system. Um, and community composting is indeed one of those solutions. Um, and so very pleased to be here today and excited to learn from all of you. It's awesome to have you all. Thank you for joining us. And um, this webinar is a little bit of an outlier in the series we've been doing on local government support. So, because it wasn't directly focused on local government support for community composting, but we have three of our panelists represent local government. I think it's interesting that you're kind of in different agencies. Sophia, you're in public works. Sandy, you're in the climate resiliency office. And Jay Lou, you're the urban ag director. So it's, we have um, a bunch of perspectives um, represented today. So my first question to you is what excited you the most about the census findings? And we're just going to go back in reverse order. So Caroline, I'm going to start with you, sorry. but. Anything jump out at you? Well, I think, you know, with my, my refed food waste hat on, um, I thought it was really exciting to see how completely focused on food scraps community composters are on the whole, as compared to like the, the, the larger infrastructure that uh, exists to the extent it does in this, in this country. So that was really, really cool to see. Um, and I think the other the other part that is so exciting is just seeing the deep community impact um, in all of these different ways. And I'm really excited for kind of how you'll think about for the next census, trying to, to get that represented in some way, because um, that is really exciting um, and um, something that is very, very hard to quantify, um, but really important to recognize and to include in the decision making um, along the way. So those Sandy, are Sandy. So that to me. Thank you. Sandy, what about you? So I think generally the I was really excited about just the diversity and the different models and all the associated needs that those bring. Yet there's kind of just a shared purpose throughout the whole the whole census and the whole um, community that participated in the census. Um, and then specifically, I'm really excited about the whole staff demographics piece of it. Um, the city of Boulder is really working hard on its um, equity goals and having such such a diverse and inclusive amount of uh, folks that are involved in the business is, is just something that's really exciting for us in Boulder, for sure. Jay Lou, anything jump out at you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, I mean, just wonderful data as a whole. Um, really enjoyed reading it and going through it again. I think each time I see something a little different. Um, you know, working in the municipal space, I mean, policy is a is definitely a big part of the work that we do. Um, so, in looking at the policy uh, changes or recommendations, um, one that I really <laughs> smiled about and thought was just great to hear was that uh, prioritizing and or not undermining. Uh, community composting projects. I think that is something that's just really clear and direct and something that I think is very tangible as a municipal leader uh, to be able to to kind of focus on and quite frankly prioritize. Um, and then I just came from a um, food systems funders conference last week in Washington, D.C. Um, so yeah, I mean, funding is, funding is key in so much of this work and all of this work, quite frankly. So um, yeah, I, I've got thoughts on that and I'm glad to see that being elevated and uplifted. Sophia, I, you know, you mentioned that you, our former colleague of ours at ILSR, and Sophia actually started the census project before she left, so you must be excited to see that that it was actually finally birthed. But anyway, what in terms of its findings or any of the work, did anything excite you the most? 
Sure, yeah. I mean, so much, so much good data. Um, I was excited about how many jobs could be created by only 50% of food waste diversion. It's like, it's astounding um, how impactful, um, not only in terms of like the jobs market, but also like environmental, climate health, resiliency, food systems, just 50% of diversion could be. Um, yeah, that was really exciting. And then like Sandy, I really enjoyed um, some of the diversity statistics too, just hearing how diverse community composters are compared to other workforces, and then also how they're kind of modeling this radical care and support for historically underserved communities. I think that's really special. Courtney. I really loved the beginning of the presentation uh, where you presented the timeline of when community composters have launched. Um, in a separate webinar that you've done, you have a beautiful time lapse with where they popped up and when. And it really helps, I think, draw a picture that this is a growing movement, that more and more of us are popping up, especially now at an exponential rate, and more and more of us will be coming to government to ask for help. So this is a really cataclysmic, cataclysmic moment, and it's happening everywhere across the country. We could put that on a map um, for others to see. Uh, so this is just a really exciting time. Um, and so I'm just happy that we're having all of these conversations. Looks like Clarissa is going to show. Oh maybe teasing us <laughs> is it running does that work yeah it's working so this is the map courtney was just talking about um that just shows again it was based on the census so this does not represent all community composters that are operating in the country um but just of the ones that we document in the census just when they started so yeah thanks courtney for spotlighting that and that's available on the landing page for the census which I think Jordan um, um, shared already so I'm gonna go back again Courtney starting with you was there any part of the census that made you kind of groan like oh no that challenge feels so insurmountable so and again we'll try to uh, needless to say that the briefer your answer is the more questions we'll get to and for those of you who are listening in um we're going to do this moderated part of the panel and then we're going to start answering your questions so keep them coming in the uh in the chat box all right courtney anything that made you groan so contamination i'll definitely have to put it out there um what community composters i think are really good at and what clarissa was able to communicate to this audience is that we're at that direct point where we receive material and we can really clean it up before it gets composted but the material streams that are coming to community composters we get questions all the time of this compostable packaging um, and the persistent herbicides. There's just a lot of things, even at the community level with contamination that are still hard to control. So, yeah, it's, and you know, it's, it's yeah, contamination is a big one. Clarissa, I forgot to include you in the first question, because you, um, <laughs> but, so now you get to say what was the most exciting thing for you, but also um, if there's anything that made you kind of go, oh no. Um. The most exciting thing, I, I think like the, I was already so familiar with so many of the benefits of composters in our network that those didn't surprise me as much as, much as the statistic on the gender difference. So that's fun to see, fun to see visualized. Um, and yeah, I think the one that I think about most as a, as the coordinator for the coalition is that scaling up is such a big challenge and it's something that we have yet to kind of articulate a very specific vision for um, or address, I mean, it looks differently in every place, like spoken hub models or different ways for scaling up. So definitely wanting to focus on that more in my work. Great, Sophia, anything jumped out at you on the oh no side? <laughs> It was it was hard to think of because there were so many good things, but um, the PFAS issue obviously feels very big and like we're just touching the tip of the iceberg right now. But then also the access to land, um, it's something that we have been struggling with, you know, in the city. And when I think about it, I get into zoning and then that, then my mind just totally scrambles because um, it's so complicated and they don't understand zoning fully to be able to re remove those barriers. But um, it's, it seems like a very common, common problem for folks. So. JLU. 
Um, not a big groan, but something that, you know, I just thought about as far as the, um, the reality of climate, right, and climate change and climate mitigation and just connecting um, some of this work and some of this language to that. Um, so not a groan, more of an opportunity, I think, to, to keep pushing that. We know that climate is not new. We know that it's obviously something that <laughs> has been with us all of time. Um, and quite frankly, it has become the hot topic, right? It has become the hot framing. Um, so just thinking of ways to, to maximize that opportunity. All right, Sandy. So, yeah, I don't have a lot of groans either. I, I will definitely second the contamination that Courtney brought up. That's a huge issue for a small local government that has an ordinance actually around a regulation around separating waste. But um, also just working in local government and a, a general groan is just that things take a long time. They have to be, there's so much that goes into getting anything done through local government due to the need for transparency and um, just moving very slowly and deliberately through processes that I, I'm a go-getter and I just want to get it done, but sometimes it just takes more time than I would like, so that makes me groan. Caroline, anything you want to add on this question? I think everything that everyone has said so far is, is perfect. Um, the, the only thing I would just say, because I spend most of my time thinking about, um, you know, investment and funding for food waste solutions, um, but I think I'm actually, I wasn't surprised um, to, to, to see that that's a top challenge, um, but I'm actually more optimistic about that. And I think we can kind of help find a solution. And um, there's just such a great story here, um, especially for impact oriented investors and funders. And I think it might just be a matter of more education and awareness. Um, so I feel more optimistic about that particular challenge. Um, some of the others, like like Sophia said, I think my brain scrambles a little bit because I, I just can only imagine all of the, the moving parts and the, the stakeholder management that's required. Um, but that's the only thing I would add. Yeah, and that's good. I think that leads very well into the next question, which was, you know, the top challenge was scaling up. So I want to do this in kind of two parts. I want to do a lightning round. And of course, for scaling up, you need investment in finance. So um, so the, the, the lightning round is just, it's kind of like yes, no. So really quick, your answer. So do you think if money and land, let's say, were no obstacle, that community composting could scale up to handle a majority of a community's wasted food. And let's assume, of course, we're doing waste prevention, and rescuing edible food first, so just what can't be prevented and rescued. What's left? Can community composting handle majority if money and land were no object? So yes, no. Caroline. Uh, um. Uh, I would say it depends. Okay, we'll come <laughs> back. On the community. <laughs> All right, yes, it depends. Sandy. I would say absolutely. Boulder's ready. Boulder can do that. We can do it. All right. Jay Lou. I believe so, yes. Sophia. Yes. Courtney. Absolutely, yes. Clarissa. Yes. All right, Caroline. What does it depend on? <laughs> Well, I think it depends on how good we can get at prevention, because um, I, I think when we, we look at, um, I guess, ReFed's es estimate was that there were 80 million tons of um, food waste in, in 2021, um, and we've modeled out a number of solutions, um, you know, based on a number of assumptions and things like that, but it's our, our best estimate. Um, and um, if we can ramp up all of those solutions, um, you know, there'll still be a lot of unaddressed um, waste happening, uh, like higher up the supply chain on farm and in consumer environments. Um, and we don't know yet what the solutions, they're, they're probably out there, um, but it's an area where we need more innovation. And if we can get that innovation going and address address that kind of with prevention solutions. I think, you know, it obviously will be much better for all of our impact statistics, but also for, um, you know, leaving less to be addressed um, at the end of the, of the chain. Um, 
So, but yeah. seeing the confidence expressed by all of these experts in community composting just makes me feel more confident too. <laughs> You know, one thing that I thought, you know, one thing we hear about as an as a reason why community composting can't handle like large portions of a community's wasted food is, oh, you can't, community composters, they don't always handle meat or, you know, cooked food or, you know, they just want the clean stuff or they don't handle the packaged food. And one of the findings, I don't know, Clarissa, you had the stat handy, but it was something like more than 20% of the respondents were taking material from grocery stores universities and larger food waste generators. And we're seeing that increase, not everybody. I mean, as Clarissa said, this this sector is one of our key findings was very diverse. So you have all volunteer run programs and you have commercial operators, but some of the, some of the you know, they're doing a, a hub and spoke system. So you can still be like, collecting and going to farmers and keeping it local within your community and engaging the community through education participation, but you can be, we're seeing increasingly the ability to handle from large food waste generators, which to me indicates that it can handle a broader uh, part of the wasted food in a community. It's not just, you know, community gardens and drop-off sites. So anyway, um, all right, so Courtney, I'm going to ask, um, just you as the co-founder of the California Alliance for Community Composting and pretty much the panelist today that's representing community composters, maybe Clarissa too, but what do you see as the keys to scaling up? What's your wish list? What you got? <laughs> Great question. So at the end of uh, a state funded grant program that we ran that finished in March of this year, we actually did survey all of the people that participated in that program on what is preventing you from scaling up. And I would say uh, a majority of the respondents actually said staff, paid staff. So they are satisfied with their equipment, with their operations, with the amount of volunteers, communities, feedstock, everything. They need more staff. Um, to create a new site or to be able to handle more material at that site. So it would be funding for the staff um, and especially with organizations that don't normally charge a revenue um, in order to process this material, uh, it, that is a challenging chicken before the egg problem. Yeah, and we've been hearing that too from our coalition. Jay Lou, as the city's urban ag director, can you talk a little bit about how this, a city like Atlanta is supporting community composting by tying it to urban ag and food justice issues? And I don't know if you have anything to kind of respond to Courtney on paying staff, because I'm sure that's also an issue within the community composters within Atlanta as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, quick thing about paid staff. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, paying staff and paying staff, you know, living wages, right, you know, that's super important. And um, I know something that we're all going through, and definitely for folks in the urban agriculture space and agriculture in general, um, that's, that's also an issue. I think for us at the city of Atlanta, um, you know, one of the things is really living up to our mission. So our mission in the um, urban agriculture and food systems team um, is to cultivate a more resilient, equitable, inclusive, just, and accessible food system in Atlanta. So really practicing what we preach, um, putting some thought and intentionality to that. And I'll just share two quick examples. Um, we don't have a local food system strategic plan in the city of Atlanta or the Atlanta metro area for that matter. Um, so, you know, through some American Rescue Plan Act funding, we've been able to staff uh, someone on the team to really lead that work um, and also to even have paid community members to also con uh, contribute to the creation of that and to hire a consultant as well. So again, when we're talking about equity, inclusiveness, and just, um, that's one of the ways. And then also proud to quickly announce that uh, we did receive a community uh, a compost food waste reduction grant from the USDA, uh, and ILSR is one of our partners on that, uh, where they'll be working with us on creating a community compost plan, again, citywide. Um, so again, these are some of the things that we're working on um, that speak directly to urban agriculture and food justice issues. But I wanted to just really pull out equity, inclusiveness, and justness as part of how we um, are intentional about it. Yeah, and Sophia in Baltimore, I know that's key issues for the city. The, the city of Baltimore has been working on that as well. Can you just speak to, um, you, you also have deep background in community composting, as we already mentioned. Um, can you just speak to um, share any insights and what from a public works department 
you know, what is the city doing now or is planning to do to support the growth of a decentralized composting infrastructure in Baltimore? Sure, yeah. So in Baltimore, we were privileged enough to, you know, work with ILSR and NRDC a few years ago through the Food Matters program as one of their deep dive cities where we got the chance to explore, you know, the whole hierarchy of um, food waste diversion and reduction. Um, and part of like the legacy of that program is that we do have a really robust network of uh, food rescue organizations in the city who like thrived during COVID um, and were able to really like rise to the occasion of community care. Um, and that those programs have continued on. So, um, you know, we, we actually also re received um, one of the CSWR USDA grants this year and, and um, through that, we're, we're working with ILSR and we're also supporting our, um, our food rescue organizations um, with support grants so that they can continue doing the work that they're doing and expand, expand their programming. Um, one first step that we've kind of taken at doing um, organic diversion is uh, we've created a network of decentralized food scrap drop-off locations that are at our citizens' convenience centers where they can drop off other you know, recyclable, hard to recycle materials. Um, and through that grant, we're also expanding those food scrap drop-off locations to make them accessible to more areas of the city um, you know, to get at that equity equity lens. Um, another thing that happened in Maryland um, this year was HB 264, um, which is an, uh, it's a diversion mandate for large-scale food waste generators. Um, if there's an organic facility within 30 miles that has capacity, they're required to divert a certain amount of their, um, their food wastage. And I think that that legislation, it's a, it's a state-level legislation, but what it really does is it incentivizes infrastructural development and um, create business opportunities for you know small small business providers, and so I think that that was really um, like a very good um, galvanizer, you know, uh, um, through legislation um, um, for Maryland. So I mean, I could keep going. There's so many things. We just finished our solid waste management plan, um, and in it, we have a lot of recommendations on ways to improve our support um, for organic diversion. I think maybe one of the clearest ways, and JLU you kind of alluded to it, is adopting, you know, organic um, diversion goals, adopting zero waste goals, and kind of giving small business, um, provide small service, small scale service providers, decentralized service providers, an opportunity to know how to grow. Um, because I think sometimes it's um, difficult to predict, you know, which way the government is moving. It's such a big, um, big beast. And so to be able to adopt goals that are transparent, that everyone can participate in, to know how to orient towards the future, um, could be a really uh, impactful way to support, you know, decentralized uh, composting. Yeah. And, you know, that is a good lead into the question I was going to ask you, Sandy, because I know um, one of the key obstacles was policy, and you do a lot of working on policy in Boulder. And as Sophia mentioned, just working on some of the, the, the institutional policies and framework that are in place can help guide the infrastructure that gets rolled out and where the priorities are. So policy is really critical in a number of ways. And we one of the questions that came in um, in the chat is just what are the policy suggestions for supporting community composters? I can add to that too, but Sandy, tell us what role <laughs> policy is playing in Boulder that's driving local composting. And a uh, follow-up question I have since you're in the Office of uh, Climate Resiliency is how, and and I think JLU mentioned this, the climate is such a big issue. How are you able to connect, you know, elevate, amplify the importance of composting, especially locally, in the context of building climate resiliency in the city? Uh, yeah, absolutely. We. Um... First, regarding the policy question, um, we, as I mentioned earlier, have what's called a universal zero waste ordinance in Boulder, which does require the, the waste streams be separated into landfill recycling and compostable materials. And um, that's what we have number one in our city is a, is a regulation right here in the city of Boulder. Um, we also work with community and other partners at um, Boulder County um, and are actually in the process with them right now, where they're in the process of changing some regulations around on-farm composting in unincorporated Boulder County that's going to allow composting to have many more, um, allow on-farm composters to bring in feedstocks and food scraps into their farms, going to allow them to sell compost that they make on their farms. 
and it's uh, it's called composting incidental to farming operation. So it's something we're working on with the county to change some county level um, zoning regulations. Um, we also work a lot on the state level through our state organization, the, the Colorado Composting Council, to um, advocate for composting legislation. Um, most recently in the past legislative session, we had a couple of compost related bills that we helped to push through. And one was kind of like, a, I like to call it our organics management plan 2.0, our um, regulatory agency around composting in Colorado. It's called the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And they do all the permitting um, around compost sites and wrote a, an organics management plan um, a couple of years ago that they're now drilling deeper into to do a study around some of the higher uh, key points of that plan to help per push through some more composting legislation um, in the next legislative session. And we also had a, a label, a compostable products labeling bill that went through that's very similar to Washington State. Now, when it comes to um, connecting local composting to climate resiliency, I'm super fortunate here in our climate initiatives department that we not only have a circular economy team, we also have a nature-based climate solutions team. And a lot of the work that I'm doing kind of crosses the, the, the border between those two areas of work because we all know that keeping our organic resources local and treating carbon as a resource instead of a waste uh, product that needs to be collected, if we keep it in the soil, we can create a bioeconomy that returns life to that depleted soil, which which um, in itself helps with climate resiliency, but also helps to regenerate ecosystems and biodiversity. Um, we're doing some interesting studies and projects with adding mycelium to, or you know, mushrooms to compost in soils to not only help to do, help with soil regeneration, but also wildfire resiliency. Because you know, adding mycelium to compost into soil basically turns it into a sponge, and fire doesn't like water, so. There's a lot of really interesting connections between composting and what it can do to create healthy soil and what that means, of course, for, um, for climate change and for treating carbon as a resource instead of um, something that needs to go away. Um, I, we are specifically as a municipal government um, messaging really hard that the soil, the soil story, not necessarily the what goes where, we're how to sort your waste, but what about composting being a soil making enterprise and a social enterprise and a local enterprise and um, a way to create a circular bioeconomy that keeps things within our borders and keeps us um, resilient. Good, so many things to unpack there. We need another whole hour, but I'll just <laughs> say that um, we here at ILSR are, are uh, just embarking on documenting uh, model policies that uh, address healthy soils that can integrate composting into that. That's just one. And two, my understanding is if your local community is working on a climate action plan, if you can get nature-based solutions like community composting into that climate action plan, you will open up some doors for funding under the uh, Federal Inflation Reduction Act. And there's like a couple of billion dollars potential, especially if you're working in an underserved uh, community or a uh, community that's facing environmental justice issues, because some of that money is really earmarked for those communities. So that's that's a key way to get to get funding and policy. There's so many other types of policies in addition to the the good list that Sandy started with, and I'll just point uh, people to I mean zoning, such a big one that was a big obstacle that came up. I don't know Clarissa, if there's anything you want to add on this question of um, uh, policies or what local government could do, but zoning is, is certainly one. It, uh, go ahead. I mean, what I know, I know because the community composters reported it in the census, so I would recommend going back to that list and taking a closer look at, um, in each overall thematic category, there are a couple examples of types of policies that would fit into that. And um, we have a, a few more quotes also from the community composters themselves saying, like, this is what's bothering us about our permitting policies where we're at. This is what's bothering us about funding. So I would just point you towards the community composters that uh, know what they need more than I. Yeah. And to add to that, you know, local government, you know, can contract with community composters for not only curbside collection, but the food 
food scrap drop-offs, they can do public-private partnerships. As I mentioned, some of our previous webinars, webinars touch on some of those techniques. And I want to get to Caroline. I want to start talking finance and investment. So beyond local government doing direct um, contracts and, of course, going after some of the foundation or federal agency money, which I think is kind of obvious, um, you know, as Caroline mentioned, ReFed is... Um, you know, a national nonprofit working to reduce food waste, and one of their key strategies is catalyzing capital and innovation. Um, so, Caroline, share how ReFed is driving this this impact and shepherding the capital needed for these solutions, and how can we get more of that investment flowing to community composters? Yeah. So, um, so we have kind of three main ways that we're trying to catalyze capital. Um, and the first thing is really um, around data. We're, we're tracking funding in the space. Um, and we have something called the Capital Tracker, which is on our website, where we've tracked, we're tracking all the private investment flows. And now, like hot off the press as of yesterday, um, philanthropic funding into uh, food waste solutions. Um, and so that's one thing that we do. We try to kind of bring some transparency around what funding is available. Um, we don't yet have government um, funding in there, but we're, we're hoping um, sometime maybe later this year or next year to add that in. Um, the other thing that we do is we try to connect people and, and bring together um, the, the uh, you know, people with the money and the people who are doing the work on the ground. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is through something called the Food Waste Funder Circle that we launched about a year and a half ago. Um, and basically that is a free network for any kind of funder, whether it's a private investor, a philanthropic funder, a government funder who is interested in food waste and putting some of their capital to work in, in, that, um, in food waste solutions. Um, and what we do, we, we invite all solution pro providers that are raising money to share that um, data with us. And then we compile it and we share that with our, our members. And right now we have about 160 members of that network. Um, we're trying to grow it, particularly um, in bringing in more philanthropic funders, because there are so many um, food waste solutions where um, grant funding or kind of impact first funding is so critical. And we, we like to think about that as catalytic capital because that is funding that will have long term impact and kind of over and above the amount of funding that, that they're putting in. The dollars will have ripple effects. Um, so um, that's the second thing we do is try to kind of bring people together. Um, and then the third thing um, that uh, we started doing um, during COVID is actually deploying grant funding ourselves. Um, and in 2020, that was through the, the launch of our COVID relief grant fund. Um, we basically raised philanthropic dollars and then redeployed that um, to solution providers who were kind of responding right away to the, the crisis. Um, and then we've launched kind of based on our experience there we've launched something called the catalytic grant fund so again this idea of, of catalytic grant funding that is flexible it's um you know looking at the long term it is impact focused um and what we're trying to do with that is again raise philanthropic funding and then deploy it over time through a series of open calls that will each be built around a, a theme um within you know the the big food food system. Um, so, so those are kind of the three things that we do. Um, and uh, I think I lost track of <laughs> the rest of your question. No, that's um, good. I'll just just to clarify, just to restate for the community composters who are, who are listening, is what do they need to do to get on your list? So to get those solicitations when there's opportunities won, and and can they register as a solution provider so they can be connected to some of these investors? And how, how does that process work? So what do they what do they actually need to do? Um, yeah, so we have, there, there are um, kind of two forms that, survey monkey forms that I would um, point them toward. And I'm not sure if I'm able to share the links here, but um, maybe there's a way to share that after the, the call with everyone. 
who attended, um, but, but it's as easy as kind of just filling out this form that um, tells us how much funding you're looking to raise. Um, and then that goes into our report that we share with the membership. Um, one thing I will say, we, we, are, we are in a learning journey um, and we're trying to figure out how we can best make those or present those opportunities, um, particularly to philanthropic funders. Um, because one, one other thing that stood out in the, the census data is that um, I think it was 36% of uh, the respondents said that they are, they're able to cover their costs with their, their revenue without taking into account grants um, and other sources of, of revenue. Um, and so to me, that suggests that, that philanthropic dollars are gonna be a really important part of this story. Um, and um, based on like our hot off the press data that, that we saw come in from um, the philanthropic capital tracker information, um, it's been very, very small to date. Um, I think we, we estimate that we need like 1.4 billion non-government grant dollars every year to scale up food waste solutions. And um, what we saw is that I think in the, the, the last year where we have kind of complete IRS data, um, which was 2019, it was like $40 billion coming to food waste solutions. And kind of on average, recycling gets like the smallest share, like 7%, I think on average goes toward recycling. Um, so I don't, I, I don't have the answers to why that that is, but I can make a guess that, um, you know, it just hasn't come to the forefront of a lot of philanthropic funders, um, you know, mind as a, an option. Um, so having all of this data from the census about all of the the co-benefits of community composting, I think is really important and be, being able to tell that impact story very clearly um, and in many different ways, because, you know, every philanthropic funder has kind of their thing, <laughs> you know, their their focus that they they want to um, they want to put their money toward. And, um, you know, the, the good thing about having all of these different types of co-benefits is you can tell different stories um, depending on who you're talking to. Um, yeah. And, so. you know, on this point of like telling the story better to investors, I think one of the questions that we got was, um, you know, with all these benefits, why aren't, what is it, you know, given the large number of jobs, why is much more government money spent on large centralized operations? Same thing could be said, Caroline, for like some of the investors and uh, that you guys are tracking and refed, that there's a lot more investment going to the big shiny things, maybe is one way to put it, you know, or the appliance. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I see investment on refed on, you know, the, the kitchen appliances that the so-called composters, which don't really compost in 24 hours, um, and not enough on actual community engaged local composting. And that could be in part, not for local government, but for investors, you know, not seeing the return on investment. So we have to tell a better story. And I think from local government, you know, we have found that, you know, home composting programs, community run composting programs can come online sooner and quicker than large scale industrial facilities as well. And they bring so many more benefits. So one question, I'll just open this up to, to anybody who wants to answer. They is just, um, you know, there's a question is this question of should a local government focus on building a community composting program or a larger centralized composting program? Does anybody want to take that? Courtney, I'm just going to call on you first. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Brenda. I was wondering if I should raise my hand very enthusiastically that I have the answer. So in California, they have estimated that it's going to be $17.4 billion in investments to create the facilities, about 80 of them, large scale and centralized, to be able to handle the diversion that, um, and to, to be able to handle the mandate of 75% diversion. Um, and that, uh, for the first community composting program that the state invested in, it was at 1.54 million. About approximately a million of that trickled down into direct programming. And we found that at a price per ton of material to 
move it, to compost it, and to get it into the ground, we were half the cost of what it takes a commercial industry to do that same service, without even including what it costs to create our facilities, which are really low cost, low um, scale infrastructure, three done systems, turned windrows, and these sorts of things. So if you take those statistics, we could, if the, we got the 17.4 billion invested just into community scale, we would be actually providing two times the benefits of the work we are doing with that $17.4 billion because it goes into people, into jobs, and into soil, and not into mechanics and AI and trucks and moving and a lot of things. So it's actually a more cost-effective investment on every dollar that a government could spend. Sophia, you mentioned with the, sell, the plan, I think, that you've been working on, how, how has Baltimore kind of wrestled with, you know, focus on large-scale site that can handle higher volumes versus promoting decentralized infrastructure that has, you know, meets more of these kind of equity environmental justice issues as well? Yeah, I mean, in Baltimore, the space is the constraint, right? And so even though, um, you know, in the public work language, which is usually like dollars and cents, like a centralized location, big facility would make you know, in a traditional trajectory investment sense, we don't have that option. Uh, we don't have access to land like that. And so we're kind of forced to think a little bit more creatively about what a decentralized network could look like. And, you know, coupled or layered on top of that, there is this um, really powerful community-led movement in Baltimore for um, environmental equity, for environmental justice, for the movement of zero waste to um, really be held in community and continue to live in community and for opportunities um, from, you know, the expanding zero waste market to um, sustain, you know, Baltimore residents um, rather than, um, you know, move in like the large scale centralized direction. And so um, for us, I think this has forced us to really think through what public private partnerships look like. Um, and all of the creative ways we can approach um, public-private partnerships. Um, and I have a lot of ideas of, uh, you know, um, the directions that um, I would like to see us move. Um, we are um, applying for grant funding to kind of support a lot of these um, ideas that I have in my head. But um, I think that one of the other cool things about what's happening in Baltimore right now is there's a diversity of kind of community composters and service providers, right? So there's like the small haulers, but then there's also the community gardens and there's the urban farms, there's the food festival organizations, there's the farmers um, who are right in the county. Um, and so thinking about, I think, you know, in my head, the way that community composting thrives is if we maintain that diversity. Right, so community, and that's the beautiful thing. Like we all kind of acknowledged about the community composter coalition is there's such a diversity of service providers, there's such a diversity of people, um, and that's kind of the creative, um, the creative solutions that I think are needed um, in our city. And I mean, one way that I would like to support through the Office of Waste Diversion Community Compost is just making sure that people are available. What kind of uh, on what kind of services are are out there. You know, you can take them to your local garden, you can take them to your community farm, you can engage with a, a small hauler, um, you can take your food scraps to the farmer's market and have it go directly to a hog farmer who feeds her pigs um, and kind of uses those, those food scraps as edible food rescue. So kind of engaging at all levels of the network to meet people where they're at in terms of food waste rescue and food waste diversion um, and provide like, a plethora of options, not just one option because we're a diverse city. We have many walks of life, you know, here living together. And I think um, I, would, I would like to play that role of educating and making sure that that awareness is there where people know what, what their options are and we make it easy. You know, we make it easy for you to make those changes um, to facilitate that kind of behavior shift. Um, Jay Lou, yeah. looks like you want to jump in. Go ahead. Yeah, just wanted to kind of quickly put a connection point with what Sophia is saying as well as Courtney, which is that, you know, I, I have witnessed and not solely in Atlanta, I've seen this in other municipal spaces as well, this kind of fear of as we hold things in community and as they're community rooted, that they're going to be more costly 
Um, and I think it's so important, the, the information that Courtney shared, that kind of data, um, to have that and be able to portray that to convince people that one, yeah, I'm with what Sophia is saying as far as the value of community rooted solutions and the equity and all of that, that that's really the core of it. And also for those folks who are looking at those dollars and cents, the reality is that there are community rooted solutions, decentralized solutions that are going to provide uh, potentially a larger cost savings. So at times in working with the municipalities um, and, and business in general, right? People are like, what's the bottom line? And just, I think that's just a wonderful connection that I hope people are seeing is that community rooted solutions, of course, at times are going to be more costly, right? Like that's part of the equity you know, piece of it. Um, and though in this example, there's at least some data that shows this is gonna have much more measurable impact in a actually a more affordable way, which I think is a win-win for, for folks. So just wanted to connect that. Yeah, great, great. So we have um, we have some um, kind of more granular questions, which I think I can ask Clarissa. Just I'll ask you in a moment, Clarissa, on the question on the composting practices and this scale of the sites. But before we get to that, um, just because we're on this kind of like like local government piece, uh, there's a question on: Do you have any tips on communicating, making proposals to local governments as a community composter? What is the most important information points to make to small local governments, like tone, style of communication, audience? No, nope, probably like Caroline said earlier, it depends on your community and where you are. Like clearly, J. Lou and Sophia, you're talking a lot about the equity, community benefits issues. So if you're in an underserved community, you know, making those connections is really strong. But Sandy, I'm gonna just start with you because you know, you're not Boulder's not quite there yet with the robust program, but so what what do your city officials need to hear like on communicating? What what would sell? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, as most people are probably aware, to do anything with a local government, it almost always has to go to an RFP, right? So we have to put a we blanket a, we put a blanket out there and say this is what we need, and then we wait for people to bring in proposals. And I think I think Courtney's analysis was really helpful. In fact, I'm going to ask you to send that to me. <laughs> um, I think that will be helpful going forward for sure. But um, I, I think in Boulder specifically, making all these connections that Sophia and J. Lou and everyone and everyone has brought up about how it's um, how it, it's it's not just it's not just one organization or one action. It's kind of a connection of networks and saying this is how this is how my business can fit into this network of of uh, other nonprofits that work in town, maybe. So we have um, I, I see the whole thing as one big network working together in their own ways, and that the local government needs to kind of be the catalyst and the facilitator to put that together. So making yourself a part of the the integrate yourself into the system, I think is really good. I know I'm not answering this question very well because we're not there yet. We haven't actually written an RFP to see what, ask what we want for you. So, um, yeah, so no, that's, yeah. No, that's good. Courtney, you got, you've, you've been around the, around this rodeo for a while there talking to local governments. What, so what, what's been say, successful? <laughs> I empathize with uh, policymakers that they probably have to read a lot of dry stuff all day long. So our approach has actually been able to make it fun and engaging. Mm -hmm. So we communicate what um, is important for us to advocate for in cartoons. Um, we got our start from the Sustainable Economies Law Center, and Janelle Orsi is the cartoonist, and has been able to explain these very complex problems and very immediate impacts that can happen with community composting with visuals. Um, we've also uh, taken on techniques of inviting them out to our community composting spaces. So a lot of policymakers are there because they are experts in policy. We are the experts in composting. Um, so there needs to be a little bit more of a dialogue between government personnel and those on the ground. And it also builds their confidence when they come out to sites. They see our equipment, they see our processes, they see our finished products. And we don't know what they're viewing at the centralized and industrial scale level, but it does bring them into a deeper understanding of what we're trying to do here at the community level. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap up in a few minutes so we can end at the at the um, half hour mark here. Uh, but Caroline, I just just you know since fi financing and investors, funders are so key. What what message? What's key that's gonna sell for funders that want to you know invest in this space? 
any anything jump you know if you have to think about it more that's fine but if anything comes to mind right away yeah i i mean i like i said before i think the impact story is really important and um you know the data that court uh, that courtney has shared as well um you know telling that story um is really compelling but i think it's also important to make sure you're talking to the right person um, and so I, I do think philanthropic funders, whether it's foundations or family offices, need to be kind of brought into this more and learn more about what the opportunity is here from an impact perspective. And then um, I would love for there to be like a model uh, public-private partnership um, that, that incorporates, you know, foundations, family office, grant money, um, you know, in collaboration with some kind of uh, government funding and that that is a model that could just be like replicated place by place by place because those public private partnerships or blended finance arrangements sometimes are so hard to get set up and they take so much time um, and um, ideally there would be like a template that we could just like lift and um, you know just have different partners um, involved um, so that that's might maybe wish uh, a little bit too much wishful thinking, but um, I think that would be ideal. Um, so I, I would love to see that. Yeah, yeah, maybe we can we can help with that. So um, so you know, I'll just say um, just want to go around and do one closing uh, question. I think for the questions I had for you, Clarissa, they were like, do composting practices vary significantly across community composters? And maybe we'll just, you can say a few words uh, for sure, but I'll just say that I think the report itself has a lot of detail on the different types of systems in, in place. So I don't know if there's anything else you want to say to folks listening that they could just go to the report. It's not that long a report. What is it, like 30 pages, something like that? So it's not 130. <laughs> Yeah, and mostly pictures or graphs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, quick read. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and if you have follow-up questions, we can try to try to answer those. Um, the question I want to end with the uh, with the panel here, and then I'll just let people who are listening after know that um, we're going to have a short survey, feedback survey for you that's going to pop up. Um, all the questions are optional, but there are a few questions that seek some demographic data, and that really just helps us assess if we're meeting our own diversity um, goals for reaching diverse audiences. So, and I just want to verbally assure everybody that we will never share any personal identifying data. All questions are optional, and so just uh, answer as you feel comfortable. But my last question for this panel is, if you had a magic wand, to address obstacles and advance community composting, what would you do first? That is, what would your priority wishes be? So um, we're going to go, uh, and Clarissa, you'll answer this too, but Caroline, let's start with you. And, and we'll, we have three minutes, so we got to be less than a minute each. Okay, I'll be fast. I, I think I already said it. So I want to see that template uh, private public partnership that can just be um, wash, rinse, and repeat. <laughs> Sandy. You know, we need space and we need infrastructure and we need fewer NIMBYs. <laughs> so, that's what I want. <laughs> Jay Lou. I'm excited about this uh, community compost plan that we're going to be doing. Um, I'm excited that it's going to be community informed. I'm excited that we're going to hire folks as well to support that convening or those convenings. So uh, I think we're on our way. Awesome. Sophia. I think I would say um, like skid steers or like mini equipment, any mini equipment that any community composter wanted to do more. I would snap my fingers. <laughs> Courtney. I would say the right and access to the material. So as uh, exclusivity in contract and bidding happens from government at the city and municipal level, uh, community composters are losing the right and access to organic. Clarissa. Uh, maybe just funding directly to community composters, kind of like cheating. It can cover, you know, the equipment side, the staffing issue. A lot of stuff can be covered under funding and financing and a lot of stress off the backs of community composters in my coalition. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just echo that. My hashtag has been no more crumbs, exclamation point. 
We need massive amounts of funding to get massive amounts of wasted food diverted with all these community benefits. So with that, I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy day to join us, our panelists, and all of you. There's still more than 100 people participating live, so thank you for joining. And uh, yes, there will be a recording going out, and you will have access to it. So we'll send that out in the next day or two. So um, happy summer, everyone. Yeah, happy solstice. <laughs> yes. Happy solstice. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you.